I don't know whether to say wow or amen. Maybe both. I feel prompted to um, go a little bit off script. And I want to pause. I'm going to mute myself again. And in the spirit of the beauty of what we just experienced, the diversity of our community, the uh, many, many stories that go into making up our story as we're part of God's story. Um, would you just take a minute in your chat, in your text, send someone in the community, send someone, you know, who's here with us today, send them a note and just say they're, you, that you're thankful to the Lord for them for whatever reason that might be. So just take a minute, do that. And then I will pray in English and then we'll go from there. I want to invite you to continue in an attitude of thanksgiving. Keep sending notes, totally fine. One ear on what I'm saying and uh, both ears on what the Lord's saying to us. Um, pray with me and then we're going to dive into James chapter 2 together for a few minutes this morning. So, Lord, there are, there are these moments that catch us. Moments when we can't help but know deeply that you're present. And that was one. And so we bless you for it this morning. We thank you for one another, for the privilege that it is to be your kids, for the joy that it is to be family together. All of the different languages we speak, the colors of our skin, the places where we're from, the stories that go into making up our story, part of your story. So now, Lord Jesus, as we come to your word, this incredible letter by James, this challenging word, not only for those that followed you back then, but for those of us who claim to follow you now. We're so grateful that you're gentle, but that you're challenging. And so come and teach us this morning, not to understand something alone, but to understand it and put it into practice as we learned about last week. So we give you our ears, our hearts, our minds, in the minutes to come. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to see some slides on the screen. I'm going to invite you to participate in something here a little bit, just to get us sort of in the groove. Um, Tim, I think, is going to show us, or Kaylee, I'm not sure who's on the slides there today, uh, a number of different options. And I'm going to ask you in these five groupings, would you rather? So here comes the first one. And um, if we can scroll, would you rather snuggle with me or with me? Now, I don't know. Let's not show favorites here, but... Uh, that one seems pretty obvious to me, doesn't it? All right, here's the next category. You can throw these comments in the chat too if you want, but uh, would you rather eat a cookies and cream ice cream cone or a plate of liver and onions? Doesn't that look good? Ooh, yes, I remember mom serving us liver and onions when we were kids, not, not so good, so. All right, here's a third group. Would you rather eat here, the keg, or here. Now I know kids may, may, may be a bit confused on that one, but I'm not confused. I'm not confused at all. Uh, I have a definite favorite out of those ones. So I bet you do too. So here's a fourth category, getting a little tougher here. Uh, if I offered you a ride in my new car, what would you think of me? If I pulled up with this new fine, fancy automobile, first of all, I'd have to win the lottery or rob a bank or something. But Or what if I showed up in that car. 
what would you what would you think of me if I showed up in that beauty? I've owned cars like that before. Some of you know that. I've given you rides in cars that leak in the in the roof. So, and here's the last one. And now we're now we're pushing it a bit. Would you rather have dinner with somebody like Bill Gates or with me? Oh, friends. Uh, this was hard even putting those together. Some of them are very easy to sort of figure out, but you know, some of them start to push the envelope and I had to be careful even in the pictures that I used. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you know who this guy is. Uh, if you are, put his name in the chat. Now I know that my brother will know very quickly who that is and Shelly probably as well. But uh, I don't, you'll probably date yourself uh, if you, I saw, I saw it pop up there from one person. Yes, it's Cliff Richard. Cliff Richard for sure. And uh, I think my sister's on the call here today. And I was going to tell a story about her that fits so perfectly with uh, the text that we're in this morning. So when we moved to England, we discovered that Cliff was a Christian. And he actually went to the church where dad pastored, where we all attended for a while. And um, on one occasion, it, uh, Heather was probably, I don't know, 14 years old, maybe 14 or 15. And, um, and Cliff showed up at the church that night. And uh, so many of the young kids, Heather included, ended up, you know, sort of rushing up to him. And he was famous. He's probably, uh, from a UK perspective, one of the most famous uh, musicians of all time. In fact, at one point, he was the second highest selling musician only behind Elvis Presley. And so, uh, you know, don't we do that? When somebody famous shows up, we, we want to pay a lot of attention to them. And, and Heather showed up at Millmead and, and there she was with the rest of the kids uh, making a big deal about Cliff. Now, one of the things I felt badly for for Cliff is the fact that that happened all the time, not just with my sister, but with all kinds of people. And it became very, very difficult for him and for obviously many others to just be normal human being. Well, here we are in week three already, heading into the deeper sections of the book of James. And this letter to the Messianic community from the brother of Jesus begins and began with a bold statement saying, we should consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. Not because of the painful circumstances, but rather because these episodes that cause us to have to, these episodes had uh, caused us to have to either decide to go with Jesus or away from Jesus and go with the world. And when we struggled with these decisions, we could ask God to help us, to give us strength so that we would develop maturity in making the right decision. Well, the situation that these Jewish followers of Jesus found themselves in was that they were being oppressed financially. And, and so they faced lots of trials or tests and temptations. And James, James encouraged them and us not just to hear what's being said, say, well, that's nice, but to actually put it into practice, especially around caring for those who were less privileged. So this morning, as we move into chapter two, James does not mince words. I have to tell you, he speaks very strongly about the issue of favoritism. One of my professors, Scott McKnight, rightly outlines these verses in verses 1 to 13 into three sections and labels them uh, inconsistencies, interrogation, and instructions. I've labeled them a little differently but kept the same sort of format. So let's look at what James is saying and make it practical so we can put words into action. Here's the first section in verses one through four. I called it the trial or our inconsistencies. Listen to the text as we unpack these first four verses together. James says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, we must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. A poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay, let's pause here for a minute and just have a quick look at these four verses. See, right off the top, we hear the command from James. But what's so beautiful 
is how he begins. He addresses them as the community, not just as an individual, but as family. He identifies with them. They're my family, my community, my brothers and sisters. And therefore, we can read into this. He's not calling them idiots, but he's pleading with them. Pay attention to this crucial issue. And then he goes on, even before he gets to the command, he goes on and he says, you're not just any community. You're a community that have this in common. You're a community of the followers of the glorious Christ Jesus. That's what binds them together. And it's what binds us together. See, this rises far above all other things that can bring people together. All other ways of categorizing people pale in comparison to the fact that we're in Christ Jesus. Now, what an amazing list of wonderful truths, all from just those first few words. But now he comes to the issue. They are facing another trial, as he suggested they would in chapter one. This trial is that they're being asked to reflect on how they value other people. How do they judge the worth of other people? By what criteria do they evaluate people is essentially the question that James is asking here. And so he says, community of followers of Jesus must not show favoritism. Verses two and three, he gives an example, of course, doesn't he? Of course, this is not about what kind of car they drive or what donkey they ride, I guess sort of making it contextual. Instead, he gives them a hyperbolic uh, example so that they will get the message. Let's say, he says, you're gathered together to worship God, and into your gathering comes a man who clearly has wealth. You can tell by the clothes that he wears, the jewelry he has on, and the way he carries himself. Well, how do you treat him? Do you rush over to him and pay special attention to him and give him the best seat in the place? Maybe he'll be a big tither. Maybe he'll make your church famous. Or maybe he'll make other famous people come to your gathering. But a little later, another person comes in and it's clear this person is homeless. They're causing a disruption, and so you tell them to stand at the back or to sit on the floor in case they get the chair all dirty and smelly. They'll not be able to tithe, and in fact, they may well bring some of their friends next week, which will make things even more uncomfortable for the whole congregation. Now, you can hear the hyperbole in this, can't you? Seems crazy. We honor one and dishonor the other. If you've read the study guide, you'll know, well, you'll know that it's not that crazy. I told in the study guide a, a story of my daughter's friend. Occasionally, he would venture into a church service in New York City. Once he told me that he went into a rather famous church in New York City, and a big, well-known church. As he entered, he was recognized, he's fairly famous, recognized by an usher who immediately went up to him and took him by the arm and took him up to the very front of the gathering into a roped-off section of seats for VIPs. This congregation had about 5,000 people in it, and they gave him one of the seats of honor. Now, he's not a regular churchgoer, and so he sat there for a minute or two and then thought, this feels weird. This is not how things are supposed to be. So he got up to leave. He knew intuitively what had happened was not right. How could people who saw themselves as followers of Jesus act like this? It was the right question. It happened. So James comes to verse 4, and he comes right out and says it. You are guilty, and you have judged people from the world's perspective. There it is. The trial is presented. James has raised the issue to these followers of Jesus. Okay, pause for a second. That's them, but what about us? I mean, this isn't for us, right? Like, that's, that's what they did a long time ago, and it's horrible. It's awful. I mean, we can, we can quickly see that that's not the way to behave. I'm glad we don't do that. Or do, or do we? Are we just as guilty as others of doing, well, I don't know if any of you ever saw an episode. I think the show was called The Black Mirror. We watched it with our kids once. It wasn't my favorite show, but it was powerful in its point. 
It was a show in which people literally went around sort of on their phones, on their social media devices, and they were scoring one another. So what you would do is you would go up to somebody that, in a sense, from the world's perspective, had more value than you did. And if they had a positive reaction to you, your score would go up. But if you hung out with somebody whose value was lower and they didn't respond well to you, your score would plummet. And the whole thing was about being judged according to the way the world values people. We do that. Oh, not with our phones per se, although maybe we do. We're in traffic and someone makes a rather obvious driving mistake that could have caused an accident. What's the first thought that goes through your mind? A new home is being built in your neighborhood. You look to see who is doing the building and what kind of home it is so that you can figure out the kind of people who will move into this new home. What will this do to the value of your home? When we gather face to face on a Sunday, back before COVID, hopefully one day again soon, two new people walk in. Are we not quick to assess assess who they are in a number of ways? Are they normal people? Will they add to what we were doing or will they just take extra energy? Are they worth spending time and energy getting to know? Or here's another one. We're approached by somebody after a gathering. They get us into a conversation. However, there's another person across the room that we really want to connect with. That person will give us more value. So we're not really listening to the first person, but looking past them and wondering how we might get out of this conversation to go and have that conversation. Oh, I'm glad we never do that. Where we see a homeless person sleeping on the front steps of our Edmonds Town Center building. In, out of the rain, under the overhang. What emotion do we feel? Annoyance? because we'll know there'll be garbage around to pick up in the morning, maybe some needles, maybe some all kinds of stuff that we just think, ah, oh, this is gonna be messy. Or do we have compassion? Because we know that there's a painful story in the person's past and in their present, and likely in their future also. Is our first thought, how can I help? Or is it, how do we get them out of here? Paul is speaking every bit as much to us, friends, in verses 1 through 4 as he is to the Jews. Well, come with me to verses 5 through 7, and you can see the text there on your screen. He begins to raise the arguments. It's almost as if you're in a courtroom, and he's presented the charge, and now he comes to the arguments. Listen to these verses. Listen, my dear brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? Before the questions start flying, he addresses them with two things. First, he tells them, listen. The recipients of this letter knew very well what a crucial word this was. It was clear. It was clear to them that when somebody said this, they were to pay very close attention because it was likely a word from the Lord. You see, all through the Old Testament, the Jews would have known that such a word was from the Lord. It was a prophetic word that carried with it such weight. It's best not to treat them trivially. And secondly, he reminds them once again that they're a community, a family of Christ followers. He then launches into four questions and a statement. Here are the questions, just very briefly. They're there in the text. Has not God chosen the poor? Is it not the rich that oppress you? Is it not the rich that drag you into court? Is it not the rich who blaspheme the excellent name of him who you belong to? These words can come at such a pace that we're tempted to let them sort of hit us and deflect off and go, I can't deal with that. But we must, we must stop for a minute and look at each one of them. The first question, God has chosen the poor. The Jews would have heard all this theology all the way through their history, deep 
deep theology. God was on the side of the poor. It was clearly a description of who God is and what he is like and how he acts. All through their history, they have recognized that even in the midst of their own poverty, that's when they've known God the most. And when they were doing well, they were tempted to do their own thing and give themselves credit. But God met them in times of desperation and carried them forward. Not only that, but throughout their history, they were keenly aware that God had taught them to value all people equally. That was the way their society was supposed to function. They were taught that it was the very nature of God to create a society where all people made in his image received equal value. In order for this to happen, it seemed as if somehow God God just seemed to favor the poor because they knew that they needed him. They knew this from the writings of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. They knew it from the story of Ruth. They knew it. James knew it from reading the book of Proverbs, which was such a foundation to his life. But most of all, if you remember, James knew it because he heard his brother teach. And he used to think his brother was nuts. But now he'd come to see how his brother was the fulfillment of all that the Jews had longed for. He heard him say it in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor. Well, in questions two through four, they kind of can be lumped together a little bit because they fall under the same category. Is it not that the rich oppress the poor? See, I think James is pushing two realities here for us. These are pretty important. Hang on to these. First, he's pushing us on a personal level. He acknowledges that those who have money are tempted to hoard it, never feeling they have enough, finding it often too difficult to part with their money for the sake of others. He's heard his brother talk about this on numerous times. He wants to make sure that we understand the gravity of the situation. Do you remember the screen that was the slide that was before the gathering? 75% of the world is poor. If we, if we have food on the table, clothes on our back, and a roof over our head, well, we're richer than 75% of the world. And I know that here in Canada, we're richer than a far greater number than that. There's the story of the rich man and Lazarus that we looked at just a few months ago. Luke chapter 16, that would have been fresh on James's mind. But secondly, I think what he's pushing at in these questions two through four is he's pushing us to consider a systemic level. Have we not allowed our society to be structured in such a way as it perpetuates the problem? Well, it's one thing for us to say, hey, you know what? I'm a little bit greedy and I don't take care of the poor and I need to do better. But we're big on capitalism. And those who work hard are the ones that should get ahead, right? This is the depth that James is going to in this argument with us. It's the very structure itself that allows this inequality to continue. And he's pushing us, the followers of Jesus, to work to change the system. He's not finished. Questions three and four. These rich people who show such favor, these are the ones who oppress you. Why do you allow them to walk into church and give them the best seats when they're the very ones who are part of the problem? Not only do they oppress the poor, they they take the poor to court and strip them of the very little that they have so that they can add to their already full plates. They're the ones that mock the faith of these messianic communities and of us they want to show their power they're the ones that seek to destroy the reputation of the church they spit in the face of the one whose name we bear this is a baptismal reference by the way here in this verse we are baptized into the name of the father son and holy spirit well what's james saying in these three verses Simply give your head a shake. Brothers and sisters, give your head a shake. Is it, you can, is it that you continue to show favoritism, judge people by the value they think they will give you? Don't you have it all upside down? The very ones you think will bring you value are actually the ones who are taking it from you. 
They oppress you in so many ways, especially those among you who are poor. Why is it that you have sided with those that it's clear to think they have little need of God instead of valuing those who God has valued? Well, how do we make this land for us at Southside today? These verses right here, five through seven. I, I'm not sure how to get at it in a 20 to 25 minute talk. It, there's way too much there. It needs weeks of discussion together. But here are two things from these three verses that I must ask us to consider at the deepest depths of our soul. If God is for the least, the lost, the last, the lonely, how do I feel about them? How do I treat them? And secondly, are we as a church willing to consider that we are part of the system that is actually guilty of oppressing the poor? And that what it means to follow Jesus is an abandonment of that system, a standing up to that system, and saying that in the kingdom of God, there's a different way. This is at the heart of the, what the racial tension in the States is all about these days, to change an oppressive system. I'm just not sure that they're going about it in the right way in replacing it with the kingdom of God instead of yet another oppressive system. But that's a story for another day. Well, in just the last couple of minutes, come with me to this last section, verses 8 to 13. He's made the charge, he's made his argument, and now he comes to the verdict. Now he comes to giving final instructions. What does he say in verses 8 through 13? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. So speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Three thoughts that come out of these closing arguments or the verdict that comes from this scene. In verses 8 to 9, we see very clearly that if you love your neighbor, you will be blessed, or you will live life well. However, if you show favoritism, which he has charged us with, which is the opposite of loving your neighbor, you're guilty. You're just as guilty as any other lawbreaker. See, James was part of a religious system as he was growing up, where the Pharisees took the Torah the law of Moses, the law that God gave. And what they did is they expanded it so there was no chance of anyone breaking it. But what Jesus did is come along and say, well, I'm not wanting to expand it like that. I'm actually wanting to fulfill it and make it make sense so that people can actually learn to live it. So he says, I'm just going to take all of it and reduce it down to two things. Love God with everything you've got and demonstrate this by simply loving your neighbor. Favoritism is the opposite of loving your neighbor. All of the law is summed up in these two things. He's clear that the early Messianic community were guilty, as have followers throughout the ages, as are we. One of our sabbaticals years ago when the kids were a lot younger, I remember taking the family to Rome. It was an incredible experience. So we stood outside St. Peter's Basilica, Ashley, who was, I think, 11 or 12 at the time, came to me and looked at all that was there, the incredible wealth that surrounded, that even inside the building. And she came up to me and she says, Dad, Dad, is this a Christian church? And I looked at her and I could see the wheels turning in her head. And I said, yeah, why do you ask? She said, Dad, if these people love Jesus, why are there so many homeless people sleeping on the steps of the church? See, we too have failed. We've shown favoritism. 
We need to continue to ask God to help us in this trial, that we may live a life to the fullest by learning to love our neighbor. And learning to love our neighbor in this context is learning to love those who are poor. In verses 10 to 12, he tells us how serious this charge is. It's not a little charge. It's not, you know, sort of a little sort of misdemeanor that, well, okay, God will turn his blind eye to that. No, he says, if we're guilty of breaking even one aspect of the law, we're guilty of the whole thing. I mean, can you imagine being stopped for speeding? When you're stopped for speeding, you, you can't say to the police officer, well, you know, I keep most of the driving laws. I mean, I, you know, I, you're stopping me for speeding, but I didn't go through that red light back there. And I stopped at that stop sign. And I, I, I mean, it doesn't matter. You've broken the law. James is deliberate in the naming of the comparison that he goes into here in these verses when he compares adultery and murder. It's like he's stating that he knows that the community are not committing adultery, but that they need to understand that to show favoritism against the poor is equal to committing murder. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount. See what Jesus says about what murder is all about. It's not just stabbing somebody, shooting somebody. It's about taking their name away from them. And that's what we do to the poor when we show favoritism. Well, verses 12 to 13, he finishes. He states the obvious in these verses, doesn't he? How can we expect God to have mercy on us when we fail to have mercy on others? We judge others by the way we evaluate them, judging them by the values of the world. And then we turn around and we say, well, God have mercy on me. It seems absurd. No, we as the people of Jesus must learn to love as God loved us and how he showed us mercy. These are strong words for us to hear today, Southside. They grip James. He's pleading with the Messianic community. He's pleading with us, stop. Stop showing favoritism. Stop rating one another on the values of the world. As I close, I have to tell you, there's something wonderful happening in us at present. We planned this series in James for the spring, but as elders, we, we just felt it wasn't the right timing. We wanted to push it off, push it off to the fall. I can see it clearly now. This is the right time. God is opening doors for us, opportunities, particularly in the Edmonds neighborhood, to make a difference in the lives of the less fortunate there. Through the food bank, that has always been a part of using the building, but we now get to lead that. We now get to run that. Through the Monday night hospitality we've called Homeward Bound, we provide to so many, to people sleeping on our front doorsteps. We're going to begin to open the doors so that in the cold they can come in and have a warm place to sleep and maybe a warm drink and even a warm meal. God has placed us right in the middle of all of this. And what's good, I see our attitudes changing. More and more of us are catching a glimpse of what James is talking about in this text. It's time for us to lean in. We're looking to hire someone who will lead the charge for us and not to do all the work, but to help us as a community of God's people to be empowered to live in this direction. It'll take all of us leaning in. And it's not good just for a few of us to participate and the rest to kind of say, well, I show up on Sunday, so that's my job. No, showing up on Sunday is so much further down the list than leaning in as God's people and demonstrating what it means to be a sign, a servant, and a foretaste of the kingdom, that this is the way God's people are called to bring equality, to bring value, to give back the name of those that are the least, the last, the lost, the lonely. Tomorrow we get a chance to put this into practice. I had a conversation with one of our leaders this week, and with this I close. Gave me such joy. They confessed that for a long time some of the issues around homelessness were difficult for them. They saw people sleeping on the steps at ETC and knew the mess that would be left there. In lots of ways, it was a nuisance. But recently, they sat down and had a long conversation with one of the people that sleeps there and discovered that there was a person behind the annoyance. I heard it in their voice. 
There is nothing that they would not do now to care for that person. Friends, that's the heart of what it means to be God's people. Not showing up on Sunday. That's not the ultimate test of worship. But in becoming a people who will care for those who God cares for and work to change the system so that individuals won't be deeply oppressed. God is at work in us. I see it. But we have a long way to go. By his strength, we will conquer this trial. I invite you to grab your communion elements, the bread and the cup, and let me pray. And in that prayer, we'll thank the Lord for what he's done for us. I'll give instructions and allow us to take the elements together in our homes, realizing that one day soon we'll get to take them face to face again, we hope. But let's pray and take the bread and the cup.